Christmas in 1700 England was a true sight to behold. Boughs of holly and ivy wrapped around street lamps and entryways. Aroma of midwinter feast, including jolly cakes, roasted duck, and rich gravies filled the air, while the distant sound of carolers could be heard at every turn. Performers in lavish costumes would take to the streets to celebrate the birth of their Lord and Savior. But when one such performer was violently struck by a supernatural force causing bizarre and frightening behaviors, many were divided on if this was a case of a melodramatic actor or did something evil enter him that day causing an 18-year battle with the devil. This is the possession of George Lukens. Welcome to another episode of Hosting Evil. I'm Emily. And I'm Jess. And getting ready for the Christmas holiday, I have the perfect episode to get you in the mood. I'm ready. I hear the jingle bells. So I purchased a religion and philosophy book that was dedicated to this case. And when I got it and opened it, three quarters of the book was all bread recipes. (laughs) All about kneading honey oat bread wheat bread like every bread recipe That's so no, crazy it's almost like okay like exorcisms plus bread equals amazing i don't know what they were doing with that but i like was panicking because i'm like oh my god what and then all of a book? sudden it just went into it That's and the whole cover so talks weird. about george lucan's you know the cover of the religion and philosophy book talks about george and with no explanation it's like let me give you bread recipes for the next 70 pages. <laughs> and then the very end is is about George. So where's my bread? Mm-hmm. I was gonna make it, but I didn't get I didn't get to that point. <laughs> so I figured though, with the Christmas season upon us, it would be good to have a, a case sort of tied into there. And this was, I felt, the perfect one. Perfect. So how we know about this case to begin with is because eyewitness accounts from credible witnesses were compiled and a clergyman from the town George lived in, Yatton, wrote these accounts into a narrative of the events that happened to George, which what he did was he sent the account to a bigger town, Bristol, as sort of a plea for help. You have to remember back then, other than word of mouth, like Mm-hmm. The newspaper was was really the end all be all. So it was then printed in the Bristol Gazette as a means to get the story out. So the narrative begins by stating that if anyone reading it believes that these are just illusions or dramatic, should be referred to specific passages in the Bible, such as when Jesus rebuked the devil out of a child showing signs of possession. The narrative then asks the reader to rationale why something similar like that can't happen now in these ages. These ages, of course, being the 1700s. (laughs) So here's a bit of backstory before we get into the article, just so we know who we're dealing with. George Lukens was 26 years old and was a tailor by trade who was from Yatton in the county of Somerset in England. He was said to be a man of extraordinary character and attended church regularly where he received church sacraments. He was a highly regarded member of his community. Trouble began for George during that Christmas of 1770. I mentioned this briefly in the intro, but let me paint a better picture for you what this time of year looked like back then to really set set the mood. Set the mood. So Christmas was heavily celebrated for roughly 12 to 14 days, and it included singing carols throughout the town. Gambling was a super fun pastime that was like kicked up a notch during Christmas. (laughs) Not sure why. Most people are saving money. No, they like to gamble. Staying up late and telling winter tales was, was a pastime, and the best of the best when it came to foods like cakes, breads, cheeses, wassail, which is basically hot cider. I was going to say some Wasseline, put alcohol in it, I'm a sure. Lot of alcohol, grain alcohol. Mhm. Mince pies and other fine meats were all spread out. 
kids and adults alike would play the apple on a stick game, kind of like bobbing for apples, but it's suspended in the air, you know, by a string. Right. And there was a ton of dancing, like a lot of dancing. And a lot of people were drunk. <laughs> so uh, a Yule log was also carried in and lit in the fireplace that included a piece of the log from the previous year to bring in, you know, good luck and tidings. It was basically every Christmas song ever written coming to life. But also like all of the pro or all of the pilgrims obviously left. So like all the uptight people that weren't celebrating were gone. Gone. They were just <laughs> all drunk, happy and merry. Um, so in addition, and this is this is key, plays were a huge part of the Christmas celebration. So the Master of Revels prepared the performances for weeks leading up to Christmas. He would have to choose the actors, the players uh, that would perform. He'd choose the songs and decide on costumes. And like I said, they were lavish. So a lot mm -hmm. of time and energy was put into this. And he had to collect the candles and any other props for the play. Uh, masks for masquerade balls were given to the actors so that those dancing would disguise the performers. So these performances would also be carried out into the streets, kind of like a parade. They were sometimes done in the middle of the court, the town. And I'm telling you all this, though, because this is where the story in the paper be begins. So the article uses old language and the S on their type was replaced by an F. Yes. So I tried to do my best to decipher everything, but I'll be paraphrasing. But ultimately, this is the story that a person from Bristol who picked up the Bristol Gazette would have read back in 1788. Okay. So yes, it started 18 years earlier. Right. But this came to light in 1788. So here's what, what the article basically summed up. George was in the middle of giving his performance out in the streets when all of a sudden he fell down unconscious. When he came to and described what had happened as him receiving a violent blow from what he assumed was the hand of someone punishing him for being in the play, those nearby stated that no one attacked George even though he felt it, and from that point forward it was known as a supernatural slap that he received. And ever since that moment, things took a turn for George. Oh, Isn't no. that always how it goes? Yeah. One defining moment. <laughs> so the first symptom after was a powerful agitation of his right hand where his hand would shake and then get distorted and contorted. Then in a loud, roaring voice, not of his own, the devil announced himself through George and declared that he devotes his will and commands the demons to torture George with all the diabolical power in their means. Okay. Well, damn, if that just isn't like the worst news you want to receive. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right before Christmas. <laughs> the devil then directs George to sing, at which time George begins singing in a different voice, a jovial but a very haunting song. Then his voice changed again, but to the voice of a female which sounded very delicate when he was singing. I uh, I wish I could see this in person. I know. I actually want someone to make a movie about it. I know I say this all the freaking time, but this is e <laughs> singing can be wonderful, but when you're talking about it being eerie and voices changing, it's creepy. The visual. It's a good, oh my lord. Uh, so then at the urging of the devil, George began to sing in his own natural voice. So by this point three different voices had come out while he was singing. After some pause and more violent distortions of George's hand, George then began singing another haunting song, but this time in a hoarse and frightful voice that terrified those who heard it. I mean, all the other voices sound pretty gross, too. Yeah. So when he would sing these songs and got to the parts with any expression of goodness or benevolence or innocence... George would change the wording while he was singing seamlessly <laughs> to mean the opposite. Okay. Giving these once good songs now a malevolent undertone. That's hilarious. Isn't that crazy? And that he could do that just with no interruption. Like you right. think about when you're talking and you want to like change something. There's usually like a couple seconds where your brain has to like catch up to what you're trying to say. No, yeah. not, with, not with this. It would just happen seamlessly. 
In addition, George was now unable to hear any mention of the church. As I mentioned earlier, he was a man who would attend church regularly, but now at the very mention, he would start to spew blasphemy and mocked the church. This was obviously alarming to those who knew him because it was so out of character for him, Mm -hmm. especially at Christmas time. (laughs) Yeah. So George couldn't speak of the church and he couldn't even write about it as he did try. All it seemed to do was drive him to the point of madness when God and the church were mentioned. So, I mean, this is like a classic hallmark. Possession symptom. Yes. So when George had these fits, which is what they called them and what I'll refer to them as, that included singing, the demons would announce that they would continue to torment him more and more until the end of his life. And they stated that any effort made by any person to help him should prove to be pointless. I love how the demons are like, we're going to do this forever and don't you try to stop us. (laughs) After the demons announced this, George began singing in both a man and woman's voice, a duet. At the same time. At the same time. And it was what was referred to as an inverted te deum. Which is a Christian hymn of praise to God, but again, changing the words. So I can only imagine what a praise song would sound like in a sinister way. Yeah, it would be like the opposite of Gloria. Yeah, (laughs) and also one person singing a duet. Yeah. That must have been the creepiest thing to witness. So these two voices that were singing that weren't George then gave thanks to the demons for giving them the power to overcome George so they could sing. How creepy is that? So he's even just bringing in like other demons. Mm -hmm. Just the voices I'm guessing other than when George was uh, urged to sing himself, like any other voice coming in was another demon. The demon then concluded the ceremonial singing by declaring his unalterable resolution to punish George forever, not just in life, but in death as well. Of course. At that remark, George's right hand began twisting and contorting, and then as the demon quieted, George was left weak and exhausted. I guess it would take a lot of energy out of you singing multiple <laughs> songs in different I, voices. Yeah, I mean his poor vocal cords i wonder if they gave him tea after i have to say too that these fits sometimes got so violent that george had to have someone come to help him from committing injury onto himself so it became i'm guessing there was a lot of convulsing and shaking that you know would you know you'd be hitting against yourself yourself your face and throwing yourself yeah around the room So in other cases where we've seen the possessed person in question, they go into sort of a trance when the demon is present and active. Right. And they're usually nowhere to be seen or heard. In this case, though, George was actually present every time the demons were. And he recalled everything that happened during his fits. And the demons would even ask questions and George was able to respond as himself. Whoa, that's crazy. Yeah, because usually it's not that way. They're usually not. They're usually gone. Yeah. So the fits for George usually lasted about an hour, give or take, during which times his eyes were noted always to be closed. Another oddity that started manifesting itself was that George would take on the persona of various animals and would assume the motions and mannerisms of the animals he was emulating. That's so weird. So weird. Not only is the singing creepy enough, (laughs) now you're like walking like a, I don't know, sheep. Yeah, right. Or a a goat or a rabbit. (laughs) But like what they said was that it looked like Exactly. Like every little inflection mannerism. We've heard about things like this before. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm like getting giddy, giggly over. I don't know why. Okay. So those who witnessed this and didn't know George Pryor determined he must be a lunatic. Like this guy's a madman. That's the only explanation. Sure. But those who did know George prior to all this was like, no, he's a remarkable person and was not offensive at all when these fits weren't happening. So there was a lot of disparity there between when these fits would occur and people being like, I don't know, I don't want to say just like creeped out by his behavior thinking he's not right in the head to he's a very pious, remarkable person otherwise. (laughs) 
besides this. Yeah, besides the rabbit <laughs> hopping on the floor, he's usually a pretty chill guy. Okay, so many different people came to see George after getting word of his affliction and tried to help him. But anything that was suggested, every effort made to free him was met with zero success, just as the devil had predicted or threatened, I should say. At one point, George was sent to a hospital where he remained for about 20 weeks and was ultimately pronounced incurable. At that time when he was released, he was now having anywhere from three to nine fits per day, which would leave him weak and filled with despair. Even when someone tried to pray over him, it caused him pain and horror. Right. As the years went by, George was losing weight and becoming emaciated and was disabled from doing anything normal, let alone work. His life had become a series of intense pain and anxiety. So the article ends itself with saying this. Should any of your readers question the authenticity of this relation or conceive themselves able to administer relief or even mitigation to this afflicted object, you know your correspondent and have my free content to refer them. So this was like a plea. So <laughs> it was like a help, a please help ad. <laughs> yes, it was. It's exactly what it was. So several people close to George over the years heard him say many times that he was possessed with seven devils, and if seven ministers could pray with him, he felt he would be free from all this. You know, if the Warrens were around, they would have answered. Oh, they would have been right there, (laughs) and they would have brought seven ministers with them. But this statement George made was treated more as like wishful thinking because everything else had failed. So no one took him seriously. Oh, no. So he remained in this terrible state for a number of years, 18 from start to end to be exact, just to keep in mind. Poor George. Even though during those years, every medical treatment was still being thrown at him to see if anything could help, nothing did. Right. One person, Sarah Barber, was in such despair over seeing her friend tormented that she brought George to Bristol, the town that released the article years Mm -hmm. before on June 7th, 1788 to see if anyone could help him because they were from a smaller town. So I guess the idea of going to a bigger Bigger, town was probably more beneficial. Yeah. Many people had read about George's situation in the previous article. So when he came to their town, it was like the hot topic of oh, yeah. all he discussion. Oh, yeah. like a freak show. Some religious people in the town from various denominations read of George in the paper and wanted to visit him. All these religious people who visited George agreed that the fits seemed to come on at roughly about 7 o'clock in the morning, then again at 11 o'clock in the afternoon, and then at 7 o'clock in the evening. But frequently, he had a few in between, totaling seven fits a day on average by this time. Wow. A written account of one of these people who visited George wrote the following. Wednesday, the 5th of June, about quarter before seven in the evening, I went to see George Lukens, of who it was reported upon respectable authority that he was possessed by the devil. (laughs) I like how they have respectable authority. (laughs) Respectable. Well, couldn't just be a lay person, you know. After I had been with him about 20 minutes, his fits commenced by a violent convulsion of the nervous system, beginning with a powerful agitation of the right hand, which soon extended over his whole body. The agitation was attended with such shocking distortions of the countenance that it is impossible for language to describe. After he had been in his situation for about a quarter of an hour, he made a deep roar in a voice that made the room shake. Immediately after the roar, the demon, as if enraged, violently exclaimed, Damn thy soul to hell. I mean, (laughs) can you imagine being... In the room? No. This is rough. Yeah. So the devil went on to mock those who thought they could come and help George by exclaiming that he has supreme command over George and that it is vain for them to try. The devil then swore by his eternal den in hell that he would torment (laughs) George 10,000 times worse than ever. 
this is rough. They like, keep this upping is rough the ante. Yeah. yeah. Man. A short pause ensued, following by George's face becoming violently distorted. Then several distinct voices, but in feminine tones, repeated the same words as the devil had said before, but in a more jeering and taunting manner. Ew. Then the eerie singing began, as if they were triumphing in that they had power over George. I can't even, like... Imagine. I can't. And it, and if I try, which I did several times, I get, like, super creeped out Yeah. in, like, broad daylight. <laughs> it's just, like, <laughs> so creepy. And this singing, it's important to note, wasn't a particular song with specific words, but each voice would take a turn singing something different. So it was even more creepier because it wasn't like a song. Ew. It's like really bad improv. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Then another pause occurred, which was a few minutes long, followed by the devil yelling in a horrible voice, I command you, my servants, to attend. Now you are here. We will have dance and song. Accordingly, the softer female voice then sung a very haunting song that sent chills down everyone's spine who was in the room. After the song was finished, another song commenced but was more dialogue in nature. The voices were loud but at the same time soft, and while the singing went on, George's legs and arms were in odd motion the entire time as if he was a puppet and the various voices singing were the puppeteers that's crazy so basically he just got taken over by like a theater demon yeah they were all (laughs) actors well you have to remember he was an actor right that's the thing like he got hit by a theater they were jealous that he was you know in the play oh god so creepy oh so it was like the show that never ends for 18 years. Yeah, for right. So the devil seemed to really delight in the singing, but also seemed to want the spotlight on him. So he announced that he himself was going to sing a little ditty. He said, <laughs> you shall hear the devil sing for once. And then, yep, he freaking sang a solo, the devil himself. And it was the creepiest singing voice known to man. Nearby dogs howled, I'm sure. I'm sure. While this occurred, George seemed to get so agitated and, I mean, rightly so. I mean, he's got the devil singing through him. I'm sure his body was, like, repulsed and responding to the awful singing. So the, the man tasked with keeping George safe had a really hard time controlling George by this point, even though George was much smaller than him and should have been easily overpowered by this, like, much larger man. Again, superhuman strength. Yeah. So more assistance was requested. Once the devil was done singing, he started spewing blasphemy and mocking those in the room for trying to help George. I just, I can't even. Oh, <laughs> poor George. So a young clergyman entered the room at this time, which greatly agitated the devil, who turned his hate on this young man, spewing awful obscenities at him. Then those female voices that were heard singing earlier started chanting so not singing now oh this no. chanting again several female voices coming so through george one person with, yeah creepy well i have to say they wrote out what the chanting was and the specifics of what they were chanting and what the devil said after and it made me so uncomfortable i couldn't even bring myself to type it let alone verbally repeat it okay so i'll just say It was giving a lot of praise and thanks to the devil and declaring him the most powerful being is essentially what it was, but in more specific language. Yeah. It just made me like, I've never come up against in any of the cases we've done where I wasn't able to relay the information. I tried several times to type it. I just couldn't. Maybe it doesn't need to be relayed. Yeah. I felt like I was like giving it energy maybe or something. I don't know. But I just got so uncomfortable that I was like, I can't even, <laughs> I can't so even weird. repeat this. And I'll give this lovely bread making slash <laughs> exorcism account book at the end if anyone wants to read up um, on what it was, that, you know, the specifics of it. So these six distinct female voices were heard by witnesses during this chanting too. So they, they were heard at different pitches. Right. Before the devil quieted that day, he bloated with arrogance and declared Everyone in the room was going to hell, the the ministers, the clergymen, 
and they would have to bow down before him eternally. Fun. Sure. That is that is arrogant. He's asking for a lot. <laughs> so this written account was signed by a clergyman stating that what I just went over with you, mm-hmm. that these facts are true, and he would testify to it if needed. Okay. By Thursday the 12th, George's fits were getting more frequent and leaving him weaker than before. At 11 o'clock that day, his right hand began to shake, and then his right leg followed suit. Within a few minutes, his entire body began violently shaking and convulsing to an inhuman degree. And then he started – I am tra- I was trying to, like, picture this. Uh, he started awkwardly waving his hands toward one another <laughs> in an involuntary manner. And then his eyes and mouth distorted in such a, quote, dreadful way that was impossible for any human to do unless aided by a supernatural power, end quote. Well, so I'm guessing it was like this. Yeah, obviously he's you guys aided can't by see a that. supernatural power. Obviously. But, okay. <laughs> Witnesses stated that the different parts of George's body were moving at different speeds than their counterparts. Oh, that's really creepy. It's so creepy. Like, this visual, I just I just can't even, like, picture it. Like, and I was, you should see me. I was in my dining room trying to get my right arm to move, like, faster. faster than my left arm. And it was just not. <laughs> but according to them, you know, and they weren't even moving at different speeds. They were doing different things. So like, like different motions at different speeds. Pat your head and rub your stomach. That's what I was yeah <laughs> picturing. But like he was doing it with his like legs and his arms, and his head would be doing weird stuff. The devil announced himself once again and called out for his inferior devils to come and join him in singing. As this enchanting yet, it, and it was like there were times where the singing was enchanting, right? So because it, it gets people right caught off guard. Brought in mm-hmm. too. So as this enchanting yet always eerie singing began everyone in the room just sort of stared like they were almost in a trance when one of the ministers in attendance kind of snapped out of it and turned to his friends and were like what the f are we doing yeah right (laughs) have we come to hear the devil sing hell no let's counter this by singing to the praise and glory of god okay finally someone woke up something then he asked one of the other ministers to give out him. So that other minister gave out the following. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my dear Redeemer's name. And I guess that's what they sang as mm-hmm. like a like a counter. Yeah, it's a counter of the chanting that was going on. <laughs> the ministers then began praying over George when the devil said, I am the devil. I will not be conquered. The time is not yet come, but it is near at hand. This gave the ministers encouragement, and they now had confidence that God would soon answer their request of deliverance. But we also know, too, that they the lie. Devil says that. But sometimes they do announce their departure or their impending departure, so you just never know right. what the hell they're saying, really. An official exorcism was planned the next day on, guess the date, Friday the 13th. The 13th. <laughs> <laughs> Seven ministers assembled Per smart little George's request. Okay. They assembled at a vestry room at Temple Church. Many townspeople had already gotten wind of the exorcism per some articles in the paper that were leaked in the vicinage, which is so funny. That's the equivalent of social media (laughs) nowadays. The crowds drew and people surrounded the exterior walls of the vestry room in hopes of hearing part of the exorcism. This was all the town had going on, right? So yeah. everyone was like, let's bring your mom, see. bring your yeah. pa, let's go, <laughs> bring the children. Once the prayers began, George went into a fit that was more horrific and stronger than usual. Those in attendance watched in horror at the inhuman sounds emanating from George. The haunting singing began and the ministers stayed strong in their prayers as George's entire body writhed in agony as he sang. After some time, George began laughing in this ear-piercing, hideous manner as he announced he was the devil. Oh, I love it. (laughs) (laughs) George then began barking like a rabid dog at the ministers as they prayed over him. Creepy. So creepy. Yeah, really creepy. I know this is a Christmas episode, but it should also maybe also be a Halloween one too. It's so creepy. 
prayers of George's deliverance continued and a clergyman commanded George to say Jesus' name. The clergyman repeated the request several times, after which George repeated devil. Of course. <laughs> then a, Jesus. Yeah. Devil. devil. Jesus. Devil. <laughs> then a faint voice was heard saying, why don't you adjure? Meaning the clergyman should earnestly implore his request. And so he yelled, in the name of Jesus and in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I command the evil spirit to depart from this man. He loudly repeated this request several times when a faint voice said, must I give up my power? Hmm. And this question was followed by a deep roaring and howling coming up from somewhere deep inside George, causing the room to shake. Wow. Then another voice was heard saying, our master has deceived us. The clergyman, seeing that his rebuking of the devil was working, continued his commanding when the voice asked, where shall we go? To which the clergyman shouted, to hell, (laughs) (laughs) thine own eternal den, and return no more to torment this man. It's always so interesting when these demons are getting, like, exercised where they're, like, they get all pitiful and they're, like, but where should we, like, go? What do you, what do you, I can't move out. It's, like, so weird to me. And it's, and they're always, like, so pitiful when they ask. Yeah. They go from being this taunting, jeering force to, like, you know, we have nowhere to go. And (laughs) the answer is always the same. To hell. To hell. Like, why are you even asking, (laughs) demons? Come on. You know where you have to go. They love a rhetorical question. God. George started violently shaking for a bit, and then as soon as his shaking stopped in his own natural voice, he said, Blessed Jesus. This, of course, being the first time in 18 years that he could speak the Lord's name. That's right. Prayers of thanks for the successful deliverance were said, and they sang Psalm 67, but only this time it was only the human voices of those present that were singing. Thank God for that, right? George was calm after that and showed no signs of possession and returned to his old life. Well, what was left of it anyways. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the skeptics were hot and heavy and not so convinced. Usually when this story is told, a lot of the skeptics' point of view is sprinkled in. I wanted to just give this account first and then tell you about the flip side of it. Sure. So the skeptics said, George, having been an actor, was accused of ventriloquism as an explanation of him being able to throw his voice. Of course. And he was also said to be a hypochondriac with a flair for the dramatics. (laughs) I mean, aren't we all really? Come on, seriously. But I feel like hypochondriacs aren't immune no. to anything. They just, you know, like to complain that they have this and that and the other. And also ventriloquism, I don't think can explain several voices at several once. voices? That's a little extra. And it's not as if they were there were recorders <laughs> no. back then that he could have been playing tricks with. No. No, no, no. Nothing like that. And like I said, many noble people were present. Right. To, to witness this multiple times throughout the 18 years. And that's 18 years for one hypochondriac, that's one, one method acting. <laughs> that's a long time to carry out a con. Yeah, right. So soon after, medical doctors started weighing in on George, and his case quickly became known as the Yatin demoniac, demoniac being characteristics of the devil, and a number of theories were given to explain George's case that included... Everything from he must have been bitten by a rabid dog. That's what the doctor said. But he would have died. Or he would have known. Yeah. Like there was no account. But that... if he had rabies, he wouldn't have lived 18 <laughs> years with rabies. They also claimed he must have been an epileptic suffering from seizures. I love how epilepsy it's always is always the go-to. Always the go-to. Yeah. Why? Because of the convulsing? Like I think so. That I mean, that's so silly, and it gives I think people suffering with epilepsy, it takes away from what they're going through to say, all oh, these possession cases must be epileptic. Epi- like, come yeah. on. Yeah, it's true. So as for our friend George, he faded into obscurity after his successful exorcism. His skill set of being a tailor had long faded away during his time under possession, and he had no means of income and depended heavily upon parish support. 
George died in February of 1805, and it was noted he had been living in extreme poverty at that point, and the only money he had at his time of death was raised by begging. Oh, that's so sad. It's very sad. Whether he was truly possessed or suffering from some sort of mental or physical illness was never truly settled, but one thing we know for sure is that ever since George's death, cases of possession have since increased with many having similar characteristics as his own. Yup. So, I mean, I think also actors sometimes get a bad rap for being able to, like, fake things. True, yeah. But that's not what acting is. Right. You know, Faking like, things. you're not going to con your friends just because yeah. you're an actor. So yeah. I, I do think that that... The epilepsy and the actor bit sometimes. Also. Scapegoats. Well, yeah. And also, like, if he was doing that, shouldn't he have been making money? Why was he poor? Yeah. Why would he throw away his entire life's yeah. work? Why was, would you suffer that much? He was a tailor in a play at Christmas. Like, that seems like a lovely little life in 1700 England. Right. Dressed in a lavish costume like he was well, living it all. Well, it probably smelled, but <laughs> that's a different issue. But he was living, you know, what he wanted to do, mm-hmm. you know, and going to church. He had friends, like, wh- 26 when this all happened. Like, Maybe why? he really wanted to be a singer, and he just didn't know how. <laughs> how to go about it. <laughs> Which voice to use. And I love how the devil in this case really brought forth his like diva quality of wanting to like like he got annoyed that all the other demons were singing and he's like no 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 it reminds me of my turn <laughs> ronald hunkler he sang Old yeah Sonny. yes yeah you're well singing is creepy it, it is especially if you're the devil <laughs> yeah but it was so funny like as i was writing the story all i was picturing was like american idol but like demon version because <laughs> <laughs> it's like they were all vying for their spotlight you know yeah oh my god i wonder if he sang in other languages too they didn't mention that he could have though i think the devil was so focused this this case on just showing off that it was like we're just gonna flex with our vocals <laughs> That's crazy. It's so crazy and creepy. Yeah. And weird. It's going to give me nightmares. I hope not. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> You're the demon. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of Hosting Evil. For more information on this case and others, you can visit our website at hostingevilpodcast.com. And don't forget to check us out on social media at Hosting Evil Podcast. Until next time, I'm Jess. Peace, love, and light. And I'm Emily. Keep fighting those demons. Hosting Evil is recorded and produced by Carly Strange at Rockdale Studios.